on them to little peanut butter jars that had figurines from The Nightmare Before Christmas um, that were created from rolled up toilet paper. So after seeing that artwork, that's when we decided, you know, we really want to show all of this creativity that's inside of Augusta. When we arrived at Augusta Correctional Facility to jury the show. The, the works were all presented to us on a table and we were just stunned by how amazing the techniques, the style, the expression, and the level of skill all of the work displayed. I was kind of speechless. This crazy idea had morphed into something beautiful and so full of life and there were so many different artists and different methods of art and different ways to create and it just brought a lot of hope to me. Even reading some of the saddest pieces like this one right here, despite the sadness and despite this piece of writing that really broke my heart, this person had found a way to release those emotions and see life from a new perspective and share how he was feeling with other people even though it was difficult for him. They don't have an avenue um, or a means to um, easily communicate with the outside world. You can see it when you read some of the statements that the, that the artist provided to us. Is they talk about this is a way to communicate. This is a way for them to feel like they have sort of almost a portal to the outside world. It gives them a sense of freedom. It gives them a sense of uh, cre creativity, expression, things that are sort of stripped from them when they are incarcerated. I did one self-portrait the whole time I, uh, I was locked up. And in, in there, it takes $2 to take a picture. I've spent $20, 10 picture tickets to get a... And I just didn't want to do a, you know, a smiley, because I didn't feel that it was me. I kind of wanted more expression and, and, and movement. And I don't know, I just wanted something realer than, than like this fake smile you put on, but wasn't nothing happy in there yet. Really didn't have nothing to smile about, you know? Our students are very uh, fortunate to have access to amazing resources, wonderful art supplies, and for our students to see what um, artists can do without that resource and w without those materials, I think it is a valuable experience and model for our students. This piece is a skull head, and it's actually carved out of two bars of soap that were stuck together using pin caps. This particular piece by Mr. Johnston was the first carving that he's ever done, and he just wanted to see if he could do something. So it's incredible to touch how smooth and intricate the design is to be made out of pin caps and soap. Like, you would never guess that it's soap, and I think that it's pretty cool. My hope is that people will see this show and want to dive more into advocacy for people who are incarcerated or want to learn more about the issues, or even, at the least, just seeing the names on this wall as people and remembering that first and foremost we're all people, we're all deserving of dignity, we all have our ups and downs. Our hope is that it can be an annual event. We're still waiting on confirmation from Augusta whether or not that's the case, but it looks good right now. The theme for the Mud Center this year is the ethics of identity. And you know, the word ethics means the study of what it is to have a good human life and what it is to make one choice over another one. And today in our somewhat polarized political environment, we thought it would be an interesting idea to look at identity as an overarching concept. What are people made of? What are the component parts of the psyche or the soul? We all have many identities. How do they support each other? How do they come in conflict? What identities are imposed on us? Which ones do we choose? How do we manage those differing inclinations, those differing identifications? And we thought this would be a great topic because it would enable us to do what the center has done since 2014, since it opened its doors, to invite a very interdisciplinary range of speakers who could look at the topic from a huge range of views. We have philosophers, uh, poets, we have a law professor, we have a psychologist, we have a socio-medical scientist. We're gonna take on this issue and I think leave not many doors closed on the topic.
mic. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Long story why I have not one but two mics on. I've uh, never been accused of having a low voice, but at any rate, uh, thanks for coming out on such a wet uh, evening. Really appreciate that. Uh, appreciate that our guests have made it down here driving ahead of the rain, possibly snow. Uh, to introduce myself, good afternoon or evening. I'm Lucas Morrell. I am a professor of politics here at Washington Lee University and head of the politics for, uh, department. I'd like to thank the Center for International Education and the Williams School of Commerce for uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, last year, the Williams School of Commerce, Economics and Politics uh, began a lecture series entitled Conversations in the Age of Trump. We called these events conversations. We're actually going to have a conversation tonight instead of just a pat lecture. Uh, we called them conversations because we were hoping to have, uh, to generate, cultivate, uh, encourage a, a diverse uh, uh, series of speakers and conversations about uh, what it means to be American citizens at a time where a lot of people are at least thinking about this a lot more for some strange reason than they had uh, in years previous uh, to our time now. Uh, this evening we're going to be hearing from Selena Zito, co-author of The Great Revolt, Inside the Populist Coalition Reshaping American Politics. Ms. Zito is a native of Pittsburgh, and yes, she really did drive down here today. Uh, she's worked for the Pittsburgh Tribune Review for about 11 years before she joined the New York Post, served as a political analyst for CNN, and uh, is currently writing also for the Washington Examiner. I thought I had a busy day job. Uh, she is one of the first, or was one of the first journalists to recognize uh, way back when that the Trump candidacy for the Republican nomination had real traction and traction among a diverse set of Americans. Uh, her book, written with Republican pollster Brad Todd, paints a detailed portrait of the Trump voter, or did at the time, in 2016, a coalition of what they call seven archetypes of populist and conservative voters that produced, lo and behold, his eventual victory in the November general election. While most <coughs> reporters were obsessed with the candidate in ways good and I think bad and ugly, Ms. Zito spent most of her time getting to know his supporters. What were their hopes and fears? What did these portend, not only for the Trump candidacy, his chances for becoming President of the United States, but also what did it mean about uh, the staying power for these uh, political hopes and fears? Is this a political agenda that outlasts our current president and especially if it turns out he serves for two terms. A telling example of her observations on the campaign trail was a story she wrote for the Atlantic Monthly uh, late in September uh, before the November election. And it was titled, Taking Trump Seriously, Not Literally. Uh, this reflected an attitude she saw during the election cycle. Namely, quote, the press takes him literally but not seriously. His supporters take him seriously, but not literally. If this remains true of our political moment, almost two years into the Trump presidency, and now with what looks to be, pretty sure, a Republican House, excuse me, a Republican Senate and a Democratic House, uh, does this bode ill for our ability as citizens to pursue a common good? to find common ground to solve the problems uh, that I think we would all uh, believe need solving. Uh, our format tonight is going to be a bit different than previous uh, speakers. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, Ms. Zito begin with uh, short remarks, 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then I get the mic back, sorry. Um, I get the mic back and I'm going to pitch, uh, pitch a few questions to her for another 10 or 15 minutes. And then we're going to open uh, the floor to the audience at that point. So definitely stick around for that. So again, thank you for driving down uh, all the way here to our, believe me, it really is lovely here in Lexington <laughs> uh, to continue our, our conversations in the age of Trump. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Selena Zito. You can take it out if you want. There you go. Hi, can you hear me? Sorry, my voice is a little bit raspy. 
Um, so my name is Selena Zito. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Does anybody have any Pittsburgh roots? Yay! A Yinzer. <laughs> um, so before we discuss the book, I think I need to go backwards a little bit and tell you a little bit about how I understood what was going to happen in 2016. Um, this populism that uh, has swept the country, uh, Donald Trump is not the cause of it. He is the result of it. I think that's a really important distinction to remember. Uh, it began in 2006. Uh, I went to a VFW in western Pennsylvania, Beaver County. Uh, at the time, the Republicans held the majority in the House. Um, I think it was a tie in the Senate. I can't remember exactly. Um, and I was going to hear, it was a candidate's night. Uh, and at the time, uh, Melissa Hart was the congresswoman who, a Republican who represented it. And she was being challenged by Jason Altmaier. And she had been elected easily for, I believe it was at least three cycles in a row. And I walked into the event and Melissa Hart was not there, but Jason Altmaier was. And the people that I saw were people that I would see at her events or going to see her speak, but they were there for Jason Altmaier. And I understood in this moment that people were very unhappy with Washington and they were willing to take a risk. They believed that Washington, Washington wasn't listening to them. And so they were willing, even they were culturally Republican, they were willing to vote for a Democrat who was pro-life, pro-gun, but very pro-military. This was at the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, um, and also believed in fiscal responsibility. And that told me something a little bit different. They weren't really in their minds voting for a Democrat, but they were voting away from Washington. And I knew that the Republicans were going to lose the House that year, even though polling didn't really dictate it until about August or September. And I understood it because I listened to people. Now, the way I approach reporting is a little bit different than maybe other national reporters. I don't fly. I don't take interstates, I don't take turnpikes, um, I take the back roads. Why? Because it helps me understand what is happening between point A and point B. If you just fly into an area and you don't understand either an economic successes or economic failures that, that surround an area in the suburbs, in the exurbs, then you don't understand the community and how it where its sentiments are moving towards. I also don't stay in hotels. I also stay, I stay in bed and breakfast. Why? Well, because the first person you meet is a small business person. And they know oh, where all the bodies are buried in, in town. And they can tell you, you know, the places to go to. Fast forward to 2010, I understood that the Republicans were gonna win. Again, not because I'm some like psychic or on the psychic network but because I went out into these communities and understood that voters, while they liked Barack Obama, that never changed. Uh, what they were unhappy with were his policies. And so they punished him by voting out Democrats. Well, so we're talking about the bailouts, TARP, um, the um, health care. They believed that they sent Democrats to the House the majority in the House to do a better job, and what they were getting was Republicans with D's after their names. They again weren't listening to why they were sent to Washington. Fast forward to uh, January or just, yeah, January of 2016. So we have three wave election cycles in leading up to 2016. We have 2006, we have 2010, we have 2014. And we're still yet not listening to what voters are telling us. Um, and so going into 2016, look, in August of 2015, when Donald Trump came down the elevator, a gold elevator in a building with a gold, his name in gold on the top in Manhattan, and I understood that there was this populism going on, I'm the, I, I thought there is no way people are going to vote for him. And then he opened his mouth and spoke. If you go back and read 
the speech from 19, um, his speech at um, at when his announcement and compare it to the speech that Bill Clinton gave in 1992, it's almost the exact same thing. He was talking about he values work and worth ethic. He values your, values your community. And he values the things that are important to you. Yes, he threw some bombs. Donald Trump wakes up every morning and throws Molotov contact um, um, bombs out there, cocktails, every day. It's just how he controls the press. But he also had a great economic message. My profession focused too much on the bombs he threw and not about what other people were hearing. Fast forward to January of 2016, and I'm covering the uh, caucuses in Iowa. If you've ever uh, gone to a caucus in, in, in Iowa, uh, voters go in there with four names in their hand. Why? Because they're in a room like this, and when your person's uh, called, you stand up and say you vote for them. That person doesn't mean 50%, then you've got to go with number two or number three. And a lot of people are, you know, trying to persuade you to go with their guy or their gal. And these voters were telling me, like, they haven't had their list. And I almost, okay, so just so you know, Republican caucus voters are all evangelical Christians or conservative Catholics. There, there, there's, no, there's nothing else in the Republican Iowa voters. And they were, they, the, the first person on their list, Ben Carson. Why? He's just like them. He shared their values. Second person on their list, Bobby Jindal, conservative Catholic. He's just like them. He shares their values. Third person on the list, Ted Cruz. I don't like Ted Cruz, they would say. But he, he, was, he shares our values. Fourth person on their list every single time, Donald Trump. I don't like him, but he's just mean enough to go to the mattresses for us. He will stand up for religious liberty, which they believed was this was the last election in their lifetime where they could get a conservative judge into, um, onto the Supreme Court. And so Donald Trump... While he didn't win the Iowa caucuses, he came in second, the information was already there. Voters wanted to be more pragmatic with their vote. They didn't want to vote for the guy or gal just like them. They wanted someone who was just a mean enough SOB to do the things that they wanted to do. And they were so unhappy with the status quo in both parties that, that they were willing to go with Trump. I understood in that moment he would win the nomination. Fast forward to July of 2016. I just covered back-to-back -back conventions in um, Cleveland and Philadelphia. When you're from Pittsburgh, that's perfect. It's one and a half hours this way, five hours that way. It was awesome. Driving home from Philadelphia, I decide, I think what an interesting story will be is to drive in all 67 counties in my state and see and talk and listen to people about what, they're, what they are thinking. Because the, the, the pretty much after the convention, everyone was like, oh, he's going to lose. Oh, that was a terrible convention. He did awful. Look at Hillary. She has all the movie stars. She's the first woman. Isn't this wonderful? But they weren't listening to what voters wanted. So I drove all 67 counties. And I identified 10 counties in my state through interviews with people and also through a visual. And that visual was there were Trump signs everywhere. And as my co-author always yells at me, I mean, he would yell at me all the time. I would say, you should see all these signs. And, and I would say, and he would say, Zito, signs don't vote. But... There were barns painted with Trump on the side. There were houses painted with Trump on the side. And as I told the class this morning, there was a horse painted with Trump on the side. This is a completely different intensity level than just going down to your local Republican um, campaign headquarters and getting a sign. The other thing that people didn't pay attention to about Pennsylvania you know, do you guys watch CNN where I work? You always see John King or um, 
uh, Wolf Blitzer, and there's like a big pretty map behind it, and they'll point to Pennsylvania and they'll say, well, Pennsylvania's gone blue every year since 1988. What they didn't pay attention to is that Democrats had lost 0.4% support every four years. And you're thinking 0.4%, that doesn't mean nothing and much. It does after 20 years. In 1996, Bill Clinton won 28 of our 67 counties. In 2012, Barack Obama won 13 of them. That's an erosion that people weren't paying attention to. They just thought, Pennsylvania's blue. I come home with that in mind. I identified 10 counties in my state that only needed to turn out 2,000 more voters in each of those counties, and Donald Trump would win. It wouldn't matter what happened in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the most populous areas. It's where the bulk of the voter count comes from. But it wouldn't matter because all he needed was 10 to 2,000 more voters in those 10 counties. And I spent a lot of time in those 10 counties interviewing people. And guess what? They weren't old, white, uneducated, and bigots the way that my profession has a tendency to outline them as. These were college-educated, upper-middle-class people, and they were voting for their communities. So I wrote into, in, in that article, I said, if Pennsylvania's gone, then that means Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Iowa, um, North Carolina, and Florida are gone too. Why? The state is, uh, Pennsylvania is five points more democratic than, than those, um, those other states. I took a lot of, cra can I say crap? Okay. No, you may not. <laughs> I took a lot of guff. <laughs> Go back to crap. Okay. I took a lot of crap on social media for writing this. People believed because I wrote it, it was because I support him. No, I'm just doing my job. I don't vote in elections I cover. But I was, something was happening and we weren't listening to it. Along the way, I noticed these different archetypes of voters starting to sort of form in my head. And I knew after the election was over, I wanted to go back and revisit that. On September 19th, 2016, after working 12 years at my newspaper, they, um, they decided to go in a different direction. And so I took a buyout. And I was walking out of the newsroom. Um, and I got a text from the Trump campaign saying, hey, you got an interview with, with uh, Trump tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Inside my head, I'm like, I don't have a job. <laughs> I have nowhere to put this story. So I, um, I called the New York Times. I called um, the Washington Post, a couple other places. I can't remember because I was like in panic mode. Nobody was interested in it until the Atlantic Monthly took the story. And that's when the seriously, literally line came out. From that moment until Election Day, I worked for four different publications writing four different stories, um, traveling all across the country uh, seven days a week. I barely made any money, but I wanted to see the election through because I understood what was going to happen. And as a reporter, if we have any bias at all, it, the bias is just to be, cover history. It's a really important thing. On the night before election, I uh, interviewed Mike Pence on a tarmac in Pittsburgh and um, wrote the story, <coughs> filed it. I went home and cried. <laughs> what, and what, and that's not because Mike Pence said anything terrible. It was, it was because I knew I just interviewed the next vice president, and I didn't have a job the next day. Next morning, I woke up. I had one more story to do. It was for the New York Post. Um, I covered election night in Pittsburgh. Showed up, and like, they had like this big, long line, and there was like, all these celebrity journalists and then me. And they're all like looking at Philadelphia. I'm watching my 10 counties. <coughs> I filed my story at 847. He had exceeded those 2,000 votes that I thought he might get. I knew it was over at 847. They didn't call Pennsylvania, I think, until 2 o'clock in the morning. But that's because everyone was waiting for Philadelphia to come in. The next morning I woke up. I didn't have any job. 
And I decided um, that the bakery next door to my house, had a, they were hiring. So I thought, oh, well, I can cook. If anybody follows me on Twitter, they could see all the stuff I bake. Um, I'll go apply at the uh, bakery. So I was walking to, to the bakery, CNN called, and said, hey, can you be on Jake Tapper today? I was like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? You know, I immediately thought I did something terrible. They're like, no, <coughs> you're the only reporter that stuck it out and knew he was going to win. <coughs> and so we want to talk about you. And then they hired me. I cried again. <laughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. Take your time. Thank you so oh, much. My goodness. Thank you. By the way, he's in our journalism department, so you may want to tap the brakes on the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in journalism, too. I, I'm not happy with my profession a lot. Gotcha. So after the election um, and being hired by CNN and rehired by the New York Post, also have a radio show on Sirius XM called Main Street Meets the Beltway. Um, and I also work for the Washington Examiner, which I've interviewed the president twice uh, for them since he's taken office. But I wanted to go back out there and take a look at these archetypes of voters that I understood were part of the coalition, but I really didn't have time to get to know and understand. So that is what the Great Revolt is about. We go back out there. I go back out there. Brad flies. Um, he's a pollster, and he's awesome. There's, if you're a real nerd about data, there's great data in the back of the book. really teaches you a lot. Um, but I went back, went back out there and saw the seven different archetypes that make up this coalition. Um, these are the people that nobody saw, uh, in particular in my profession. Now, part of the problem is the way that networks are made. They fly in to the Marriott by the airport, they take the bus, and they drive over to the, um, to the uh, rally, and they find the seven weirdest people, and they all write about these seven weird people, and then you're at home watching these seven weird people, and you're like, oh my god, these people are crazy. And then you hear seven weird things that he says, which is also part of the nightly package. And you're like, oh my god, he's so weird, they're never going to win. But because I would get there a couple days ahead of time and sort of spend time in the community, then I would go to the rally beforehand. By the way, they're like a tailgate party. They're actually fun. People are nice. They bring their little hibachis and they make hot dogs and they bring their children and their grandchildren and their neighbors. And it's very aspirational. You know, one of the things people missed about Make America Great Again is they thought it was nostalgic or looking in the past. Absolutely not. It's about to being part of something bigger than themselves. And I think that's what a lot of people get wrong about the Trump voter. And so if you buy the Great Revolt, which I hope you do, um, you will go into the lives of these people and see your neighbors, your cousins, your sisters, your friends, and you'll have a better and deeper understanding of why people voted the way they did. And it's much deeper and, and more intense, and you will understand why um, sort of they felt it was important to do this. Um, and 23% of the people in my book voted for Barack Obama twice. Several of them have, have um, African-American children. They're all white in the book. The, the majority of his voters are white. But they're insulted when they're referred to all the time as racist. And I think we need to get past doing that and listening to people better. Um, the book also has an incredible amount of data in it that helps you understand what happened in 2016. The whole idea of the book was, was this election a fluke or was this election a new conservative coalition? We decided it's a new conservative coalition going forward. Thank you. All right, so I'll take a few minutes to lob some questions over and then we'll open it uh, to the audience. Um, the book came out earlier this year and we just had an election. <laughs> it wasn't a presidential year, and midterms typically, of course, are not good for the incumbent president. 
Uh, how does your book or does your book inform what we saw happen last week? How do we understand, for example, what you're calling the Great Revolt in light of what we've been listening to for almost two years, the Great Resistance? Is, should there be a book about that? Or how, how does your book speak to that? So it, it says in the book, we actually predict that they would lose about 35 states. I think they've lost just about that, mm -hmm. Republicans. Um, and that they would win several um, Senate seats, which has also happened. Um, look, you can't cure normal. This is a normal occurrence. And coalitions lose all the time. But that doesn't mean that they're gone. I, 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 I hesitate to say this is a Trump coalition. I, I, would, I think it's more apt to um, refer to it as a conservative populist coalition. Here's how to look at it. For about 60 years, we have either been New Deal Democrats and or Barry Goldwater, right? Some variation of Barry Goldwater, you know, conservative, small government, you know, Ronald Reagan, uh, Richard Nixon, um, even Eisenhower who came before uh, Goldwater. And, and then the New Deal. New Deal Democrats came out of FDR. They were essentially about economic equality. And Republicans are about small government, like Paul Ryan's of the world. And Barack Obama changed that in 2012. 2008, he still ran as a New Deal Democrat, essentially. In 2012, he decided it would be more multinational, multicultural. It was the party of the ascendant. What he forgot to include in the party of the ascendant was just enough working New Deal Democrats. Define for us, I know what that means, but define what the, the, the coalition of the ascendant means. So um, that would be minorities, women, and young people. That is the new coalition of the Republican Party, and, and along with the elites. Of the Democratic Party. The Democrats, right. yeah, the Democrats. Um, sorry. Um, and then the coalition of the Republicans, it's, it's pretty much outlined in the, um, in the, uh, in the book. It, it's a variety of different voters. So there are suburban voters in there. There's one, the, one of my favorite voters are the, um, we call them girl gun power. So they are Republican women who should have been persuaded by Hillary Clinton's ads. They were amazing. Her ads in 2016 were amazing, focusing on targeting these Republican suburban women to come on over and vote for her. But what I wanted to know, why didn't they? Uh, it turned out it had a lot to do with the Second Amendment. These women are college educated. They live in the suburbs. They're married. They have children, and they identify themselves as feminist. Now, you know, half of you are thinking, well, no feminist would vote for Donald Trump. Well, one of the core values of being a feminist is empowerment. And these women believe that nothing is more empowering than to be able to protect yourself or your family. And that's why the Second Amendment was critically important to them. It's very different being a suburban mother in Kenosha, Wisconsin, than it is being a suburban mother in Alexandria, Virginia. You're much more, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, there's a lot more that separates you. You're not as close to your neighbors. If your house is going to get broken into, you want to be able to defend yourself. Also, hunting is a big tradition in those areas, including the area that I grew up in. Good. Thank you. Uh, Follow up on that, uh, you note in the conclusion to your book that each party, of the two major parties, has a problem. The, do you want to, well, I'll just pitch it. <laughs> that the Republican Party has a, uh, a, what you call a demographic problem, and the Democratic Party has a geographic problem. So in the next two years, which of the parties is going to be able to solve their own problems sufficiently to either keep their man in office or kick that man out. Uh. So I wrote a story today, if you can check it out. Um, just go to my website, selenazito.com, and I say, we always, we don't, we don't learn the right lessons from elections, right? We don't pay attention to why we lost and why, why, we, why we won. 
Uh, Republicans' challenge is to um, win back not particularly suburban women, but suburban men. Um, President Trump creates too much chaos. Suburban men don't like that. And so in these um, moderate uh, sort of swing districts where Democrats won um, seats, you know, the Democrats were in some of these seats were really smart to run these sort of moderate military guys um, who made it safe for, the, for Republicans to vote for them. That's the lesson that Democrats should lose, win, I mean, should pay attention to. If they go too far left, then they continue with their geographic problem. They're going to win New York. They're going to win California. They're going to win Chicago. And that's it. You know, a couple little college towns here and there. Like, they have to... That they should, what they should learn is, look, we like, you know, we, we got crossover votes uh, with these moderate candidates. Ones that don't make fun of people that are, have a Republican after their name. But to the Republicans' problem is, like I said, they need to win back um, uh, suburban men. And that is when the president should probably not give speeches where he comes across thinking that his voters are racist. I mean, some of those speeches in some of those um, big red state Senate races, I thought were way over the top. And that kind of chaos, um, voters don't like that. OK. I'll shift it to uh, the field of journalism here. Uh, I didn't go back to check this quote, but I'm fairly certain that it was Pauline Kael, the most famous movie critic, probably of our time, uh, who wrote for The New Yorker, I believe was the one who said that she couldn't believe that Nixon won in 72 and won by such a landslide because nobody she knew voted for him. So if, <laughs> even if that's not true, it makes for a good quote. So uh, how do journalists avoid the Pauline Kael effect? Because uh, after all, you didn't always believe, you yourself didn't always believe that Trump or any, anyone we would consider a populist had a chance to actually be nominated, let alone win the presidency. So uh, what would be the message to yourself and fellow journalists about making the next two years better than the last two years? We need to listen to each other better. We need to get out there and immerse ourselves in these communities. Look, part of the problem with populism, this is across the board, in journalism, in government, in campaign structures. Um, I mean, look, I can tell you, establishment Republicans, they don't like Trump voters either. Um, uh, in, in, in newsrooms, in Hollywood, in sports entities, we don't have diversity within our newsrooms or in our boardrooms or in any of these places. I'm not just talking about Keller. I'm talking about, like, there aren't people that make decisions that, like, went to a state school or go to church every Sunday or knows how to shoot a gun or is pro-life. You know, we need, we need a diversity of, of color, but we also need a diversity of backgrounds and beliefs and values within these decision makers. Populism is a modern, the modern populism is a skepticism of all things big. They've been making decisions from Facebook to Google to the NFL. Does anybody here, and I know my, the students I had today, I know you know this answer. Does anybody here know where the NFL is um, located? Go ahead. Yeah, Park Avenue. Park, now think about that. Now think about all the dumb dis the PR mistakes they made over the, um, over the national anthem. I bet you dollars to donuts, there's not anybody in that decision-making room that has a diversity opinion. They're all on Park Avenue. They made a decision based on a bunch of PhDs sitting in their seats. Well, there's not a bunch of PhDs sitting in their seats. There's a bunch of blue collar people that, that paid a lot of money, that saved up a lot of money to sit in those seats. 2016, they lost eight percentage of their viewership. 
2017, 9%. I mean, they have to, you have to have, I think all of these larger institutions, because we don't have any trust and or faith in them, they have to diversify who are their decision makers. It can't be this, all the same person with all the same PhD. They all live in the same neighborhood because they don't, they're speaking to each other and it's an echo chamber. And that's the problem with journalism. You know, I see a lot of uh, journalists in the past few years out there covering religion. And while I don't think you need to be religious to cover religion, you should at least have a little bit of idea of why it's important to sit in a pew for you every Sunday. Okay, great. All right, why don't we open it to uh, the audience now? She gets to hold on to the mic, but I get to pick. Oh. Uh, try to start with students first. Go ahead, Megan. Um, I think that I see it across the board on both sides, um, mainly because I'm out there a lot. Um, I see, um, you saw what happened to Tucker Carlson, his family last week. Did everybody see that? Um, and then what happened to his daughter last month? Um, I, I don't think any of this is healthy on both sides. Uh, I, 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 I just, you know, journalists are there to do a job. And if you don't like the job that they're doing, then go read someone else. But, you know, for the most part, most journalists are, you know, n never have a day. I can't remember the last day I had off. Um, I went to my grandson's baptism on Sunday, so I did do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, you know it, we've become so siloed that um, we, we just want to believe our side. So I, I, I just don't think it's healthy for any of us. And I see it in equal parts on both sides. Um, how do you think we learn to listen to each other better when on both sides of the aisle, politically, or, or whatever issue you're standing on, the tendency seems to be talking past each other rather than you know, with each other? Turn off, I shouldn't say this since I work for CNN, but we shouldn't be watching cable news all the time and seeing panels yell at each other all the time. Uh, we should, like, shut down Twitter because, oh, dear God, that place is awful. Um, and we should just put our phones down and listen to each other. More than often, there's probably, we probably have more middle ground on things that we agree on than things we don't agree but for some reason in this country, we have decided every morning to put our team jersey on, and we're going to plow down the person who has the other team jersey on. And I, I just don't think that that's really healthy. Is, if, can I piggyback on that? Is this a moment where uh, either party or a politician can step in and model that and to a degree where a sufficient number of voters could say yes? That's my America. That's my future. Those are my neighbors. I'd like to lie and say yes. But since we just had another wave election, we are not in any mood to do anything like that. I, I would. Now, having said that, I spend most of my time on back roads in small, medium towns. And I don't see it anywhere near like when I turn the TV on. Mm -hmm. I actually do believe that we are much more compassionate and much more engaged and much more caring uh, than, than uh, my profession tends to sort of illustrate us at. And you, know, and you see that in moments of great crisis. Uh, you saw it during, after the hurricane in Houston. I thought that was one of the most moving things to see how people just did whatever to rescue people. You see that in California where people are doing whatever they can to rescue people. And our generosity as a country is like no other country. Whenever there's a crisis, we're the first ones to step up, not only physically, but also with our pocketbooks. So I do believe in our greater good. You just, y'all just turn TV off, turn, turn social media off, and just listen to each other better. 
It doesn't always have to be an argument. It might just be a lesson to understand why people feel the way they do. <coughs> do you think Trump will get reelected? Um, if the Democrats go too far left, yeah. Probably bigger than he did the last time. That's the lesson the Democrats need to learn. There's a much more appetite, as you said, for someone who is more apt to bring people together, a more moderating force, someone that real, speaks more to our moral compass as a country. But uh, I think the Kavanaugh hearings demonstrated through the you know, several senators that are going to run that they just want to fight. So I just think it's, if they go too far left, it's not going to be good. Would you, would you say, to pick it, piggyback on that, would you say all other things being equal though, the wind is in the sails of Democrats and if they heed your warning that Trump is if less likely to If they go for candidates win? that, that won in the House, absolutely. But they haven't, I mean, they haven't demonstrated that. And, and I think that's what the next few months are going to, to teach us, are going to be the most instructive. Uh, yeah. But, you know, um, oh, there was a point I was going to make and I forget it. It'll come to you. Okay. <laughs> Middle, please. Yes. Um, so that, on the flip side of that, do you see room post-Trump for a, mod, a swing from, by the Republican Party towards the middle anytime soon? Um, <laughs> I, again, I think, honestly, if we just sat here and really honest with each other, we're probably all pretty much raging moderates, right? We're probably just like right down the middle on most things, in particular things that impact our personal communities, taxes, roads, um, better schools. Those things were pretty much down the middle. Unfortunately, what, um, what, what wins primaries and nominations uh, usually come from the activists in both parties. And, and that's sort of the big challenge Although, honestly, I don't think of Donald Trump as very Republican. I mean, I, he's his own sort of entity. There's a part in the book um, where we talk about category killers and category <laughs> builders. And does anybody remember um, when FedEx first came out? Absolutely, if you absolutely it has, has to, to be there, there overnight. overnight. Well, up until that moment, when we wanted to send something, we put it in the mail, we took it to the mailbox, we waited three days and we called people. Is it there yet? No. We hang up, call the next day. Is it there yet? FedEx comes along and says, well, if you have to have it there overnight, well, we never thought we needed anything anywhere overnight. Oh, and you want to spend, you want to pay a thousand times more um, to do that? And they created this whole new category. I think that Donald Trump is a category builder. He created a whole new coalition of voters. That's very different than a category killer. Miller Lite, you all were way too young to remember when that came out. Uh, but they were gonna call it diet beer when it came out. Doesn't that sound yummy? But I, I forget what they're saying was. Do you remember? Mm -mm. Tastes great. Less filling. Less oh, that's filling. all, yeah, yeah. So all of a sudden, there's this new beer. But it cannibalized other beer drinkers. It didn't create more beer drinkers. It just created beer drinkers who wanted to be fit because it was the 70s, and everyone was trying to be like John Travolta. And you know that was the skinny John Travolta. Um, <laughs> sorry, John Travolta. Um, so I, we, we came to the conclusion that Trump is a category builder. Um, earlier you said that, I don't know, you described the election of Trump as a healthy populist reaction, so I was just wondering what you meant by the word healthy. Well, it, it's a healthy skepticism of all things big. And by the way, Democrats feel the same way. Just look at the campaign of Bernie Sanders. We don't like big things right now. We don't trust them. We don't trust Facebook to put the right yeah. ads up. We don't trust Google to put the search the way we, we think it should look like. We don't trust big government 
Look at how the DNC was just annihilated by Bernie Sanders' campaign. Just annihilated. Look how they treated him. By the grace of God, he may have been the nominee if there wasn't the shenanigans that they pulled and the heavy hand that they used. So I think both parties have that, and I think it's a healthy skepticism. We have spent our entire, you know, not you guys because you were just born, um, but we've gone a couple generations, we're just saying yes to whatever these bigger entities have said, and we've decided that you know, maybe they don't really have everybody's interest at heart. That's because they became, the decision makers became too packed in, in very cosmopolitan wealthy areas in New York, in Washington, in LA, in Chicago. That's where most of the decision makers in culture and government live. And they're not like the rest of you guys, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. In the cap? Yeah, um, speaking to all these voters in, the co in this new coalition that you found, were, did you find there to be main policy drivers? And if so, what were the big policy plans that attracted uh, the voters? Um, well, tax, tax cuts were a very big part of that. Um, the judicial picks were a very big part of that. The climate, uh, um, getting out of the climate treaty, huge part. Getting out of the Iran deal, absolutely huge part. Those are just several of them. That hand that I can't see the face to. There you are. Yes. Can you just explain what you meant by in your book when you said that we've like removed the curators? Okay. So before you were born, uh, <laughs> we would get we would get the New York Times, right? And there was like 13 people at the New York Times that decided every day what you were going to read from cover to cover. And you didn't get to decide who, who, what to read. Um, they told you what to read. That's the curator. We don't do that anymore. Where, where, where's America's newsroom? Twitter. It's on Twitter. You can decide whatever you want to read and no one's telling you what to read. Here's another curator. Um, also, half of you won't know uh, what Sears and Robux are. But Sears and Robux, for <laughs> my entire childhood, um, you got the wish book, and you would like circle what you wanted, and you told your parents, <laughs> and they would give it to Santa. Hopefully, everybody doesn't believe anymore. Um, uh, they told you what kind of appliances to buy. Anybody know? What kind of appliance to get it? Can more. What kind of tools? Craftsman. Craftsman. What kind of clothes? Tough skin. Ugh. Yes, they were like as stiff as a board, right? They were awful. But they were the curators, and they were everywhere in America. Every small, medium, and large city and town had a Sears. And if you didn't have a Sears, the catalog was in your, in your um, house. They had data on all of us. They knew where we lived, what we liked to buy, how many kids we have, when we needed a new refrigerator, when we needed a new pair of tough skins. Um, and, and they were the curators of your shopping. How we didn't know that if we were going to reject that curator, well, because along comes Amazon. Now whether we have a choice of 17 different appliances. And it'll be your house in two to three days. You know, or 14 different kinds of, of, of socks that you can buy. We've eliminated the curator throughout our culture, whether it's our news. Um, think about television. Three channels when I was growing up. Three. You're old. I'm, I'm sorry. so old. <laughs> I, well, four. Now you have like 692. And you never have to watch, you never have to watch the same thing that your mother is watching in the next room for the rest of your life. <laughs> so why did we not think that when it came to elections that that elimination of curator was going to happen? He took out the Republican Party. He took out 17 really qualified people to be president. Took out all the curators. Take one or two more, yes, please. So um, you mentioned putting out of the Iran, the putting out of the climate change agreement. Um, 
all of that to some degree entails that America is sort of stepping away from its role as a global leader. The people you interviewed, were they okay with that idea? See, they see a role of a global leader as something completely different. These are voters. This is, this is really interesting. So they were really tired of multinational deals. Why? Because we're always the one that's paying the most money. We're the one that has to take it on the chin on everything. We're the one that puts the most bodies in, the most money, whatever it is. They like these bilateral deals. That's why they like the trade deal. Because he worked with Mexico, worked with Canada, and now he's pressuring um, um, China. He likes, the, the, those voters like these, they still want America to be a world leader. They just don't want America, America to do all the heavy lifting all the time. So it's not more about leadership, it's more about we are always saddled with the most um, uh, income or the most um, precious resources, our people, and so forth. One more, Bob? Um, I think you're absolutely right when you mentioned that Trump voters, Trump supporters hate to be called racist. And in their communities, in their churches, in their lives, uh, the vast majority of them are not. So why does the president use racist rhetoric? Why does he fear monger on the subject of immigration? I have and no. why does he think that works? I, I could not even, rem I, get inside a Trump voter's head, I'm, I'm, I'm your girl. Get inside his head, no. Uh, I wrote about this again, check my story out today. Um, I wrote about this. Is it bad enough that the media thinks that, that they're all racist? But he does, and that's ridiculous. And, and you know, if you spend any time with any of them, you would see that. And I, I think it's incredibly insulting. But he, I think he believes that. But, he gives him, but they give him a pass. We're seven that, miles from Charlottesville. Yeah. Where he said, both sides. He equivocated. And it's patently not true. And they gave him a pass. Those are the people you were talking to. They gave him either, they either tacitly did or actively gave him a pass. Well. The people that are interviewed there give them a pass. Look, most of the people that I interviewed, they didn't like Charlottesville. Uh, they didn't, they thought he was wrong. Look, most of the time, the, one woman put it really perfectly. She said to me, I have spent, she was just about 45. She said, I have spent my entire life being inspired by very eloquent speakers. People that motivated me to vote. And, and said the most wonderful things, and it really made me want to come out and vote for them. But they didn't deliver anything, ever. I can't stand the way this guy talks. Cannot stand it, I'm, I'm talking in her voice. But I like the results. Did she like Charlottesville? No. That's I would, a result. Huh? That's a result. No, I'm talking about policy results. I'm not talking about his rhetoric. He's sloppy about his rhetoric. He doesn't understand his voters when it comes to that. He makes that assumption, and I think that's incredibly, it's as, as insulting as anybody else saying that. I just, I just think it's wrong. I've said that several times. All right, well, join me in thanking Selena Zito.